Okay, the exam is due today, if I remember correctly. I haven't checked how many of you have turned it in, but I suspect most. You guys are procrastinators, which is good. Um, can you ask for? Well, last time um, we derived the derivative of a vector, which was nice to see. And I told you that we were done with chapter four, which is mostly true. We left someone trapped in chapter four that we have to rescue. <coughs> So the derivative of a vector r was, what was it? You remember we derived the, um, the matrix of uh, epsilons? You remember what the uh, the elements were. We started with uh, some omegas, right? And by looking at the structure of the omegas in the in the matrix, we can figure out that they are uh, orthogonal vectors. You will have d one d2 and d3. So the derivative is d omega uh, cross r. And I don't know, because the book wants to make a point or something they defined it as initially as r cross d omega. What is the difference between this, uh, those two? Handedness? Negative. Negative. So this one is the right-handed, so it's the one that you will find most of the time. And this is the left-handed. This is a relationship between the orthogonal axis. Uh, right hand rule, left hand rule. And I told you that we could use the Rodriguez formula uh, to figure out what this d omega really was. So the Rodriguez formula
And like two classes ago, we saw that you can rewrite these with operators and that the cross product um, matrix operator operates on one of those terms twice, once in once in one of them, and zero in the other one. So if we are looking at a very small change in R, then um, what is the angle between R prime and R? You know, it's an infinitesimal uh, rotation. It's very tiny. What is it? What is the angle between, what is the separation between the, the vectors? They're going to be almost equal. So the angle is what? Cos, cos is going to be 1. Cos 0 is going to be 1. And sine? 0. OK. So then in that limit, so uh, limit um, of phi goes to 0, very small um, angle. This term is equal to 1, and this term is equal to 0, so we can get rid of all of this. And we're going to do something interesting here. Um, if the angle is very small, then um, sine phi is approximately equal to what? Phi. Phi. So, you know, we're defining this over here. So we're going to call sine uh, phi uh, d phi. So we end up with, uh, with this expression. Mm. Yeah. So we can take this one to the other side. So it's R prime minus R. And we know that this difference is very tiny. Uh, it's infinitesimal, so this one is dr, we defined it before. And so <clears throat> that's what we get for dr. You can distribute it um, so that it looks a little bit nicer. Well, actually, you put this one over here. So it'll be n d phi cross r. Oh, I'm looking at the left-handed. Okay. Okay, so now we can uh, do it by inspection. D omega is equal to n hat d phi.
So this is kind of nice. <clears throat> so, uh, what is the direction of n hat? I guess what is the direction? What is the the plane uh, of d phi? Well, it's a normal to that plane, and then you have the cross part with R. So you have all of the orthogonal components. OK, so the next thing that we're going to look at is how these guys change with time. So if I'm standing uh, here in front of you without moving, there is a vector um, based on a Cartesian or some other system um, that is given by the center of the Earth. So you can describe my position, steel position, um, with a vector from the center of the Earth. And even though I don't see like you're moving, uh, you don't see like I'm moving, someone in space will see that you know we're rotating. Uh, we also have all these other movements, right? Like rotation around the center of the galaxy, so all this stuff. So the vector that describes my position in terms of some deep space absolute Cartesian system that we can imagine, um, the components of that vector are changing with time. But it doesn't happen uh, with, the, with the system that is based uh, here on Earth. So we're going to look at Like a, a month ago, uh, we had this discussion. How many degrees of freedom do you need to describe uh, a rigid body that is you know, possibly rotating? And what was the answer? Six. Yes. So how were those uh, six degrees of freedom distributed? We had a Cartesian system with, um, I guess, just x, y, and z that describes the position of one point, uh, likely the center of mass, one point of this uh, rigid body. So maybe be like here. Right, so it's coming out of the plane. What about the other three degrees of freedom? Well, we spent about a month talking about those three degrees of freedom. And our conclusion was that uh, possibly, maybe, likely, um, the best option would be the, um, the Euler angles. But you're not limited. You know, you, there's many other things that you can use. But the Euler angles, you know, they seem to be widely used in different areas. And they are, uh, they are orthogonal. Uh, they are. Um, they maintain the, the magnitude of the vectors and everything, so they're nice. They're not as nice as the Cartesian system because you know, they don't necessarily look symmetric like that. But uh, they are generalized coordinates. 
So those three degrees of freedom will allow you to describe what? The rotation of this body. Right? So this has some structure and it could be rotating. I guess in general, it is going to be rotating. So we have the, the Cartesian system to describe translation, things like that. And then we have the Euler angles, the um, rotation matrices, all this machinery that we developed to describe rotation. So we have two systems. Uh, the first one, we're going to call it um, the big one. It's going to be the space system. And this one is going to be the body or the uh, rotation system. So I'm going to draw, maybe I'm going to uh, draw myself over here. So I'm just you know, standing on top of the world over there. But you know, if you zoom on me, you're going to see something like this. So, I am, this is the center of the Earth, and I'm radially outward from that direction. So I am aligned with one of the vectors that comes from the center of the Earth and passes through me. Um, so if there's like a house over here, or like a school over here, I don't know, this looks like a school. Um, we don't see any movement you know, relative to me, you know, the, the buildings, uh, we don't see them as moving. So if, if we try to describe this from the point of view of someone outside, what we're going to get is uh, dg. G is uh, an arbitrary vector. So, you know, what is special about it is that there's nothing special about it. So that's um, uh, from the point of view of space. So I guess dg is over here. Uh, well, g is over here. And we want to see how, how much it moves. Uh, that's going to be equal to dg from the point of view of the body plus um, dg rotation uh, plus yes. So this is dg of the body plus d omega cross g. So this is the, the derivative of a vector that is rotating. And as we just um, once we derived it last time. So 
So if we just divide everything by time, by dt, then we get this one over here. So what is d omega divided by dt? Why? Yeah, so you know, we figure out that this uh, represented uh, an orthogonal system, but it is you know, centered, so it can only rotate. So when you divide by dt, you get the, the angular velocity. So that's omega cross g. OK. Uh, this is what we wanted to rescue from chapter four, uh, but it is it is still uh, in disguise because it is uh, multiplying, or I guess it is operating on vector g. So the one that we really want um, is. The, the relationship. body, sorry. It's this one over here. So body or rotation. All right, so um, this is the operator that we wanted. It is um, this equation 4.86. I guess it doesn't have a name, but we just call it 486. So what is this um, operator doing? Well, if you have an arbitrary vector like G or a non-arbitrary vector, Um, you can put it through here, and you know what is its position relative to the body that is rotating, and it tells you uh, what the time derivative is in the space uh, coordinate system. So it allows you to go uh, back and forth between the two systems. Which is useful. When you are working with this operator, you have to take the, the time derivatives, you know, if that's what you need to do for each um, coordinate system independently before you bring them out because the time derivatives are with respect to the system in which they were uh, created. So if you take the dt's out, you're gonna get confused and likely your answer is gonna be wrong. So you have to 
do all the calculus inside and then take it outside. I don't know, you might have other stuff, you know, another DT over here, for example. Um, you have to do everything here before you take this one. Okay, so another thing that we looked at in chapter four was the, uh, the Euler theorem. What did it say? And it's, um, it's corollary. The corollary is called um, Chassel's theorem. It says that the most economic way of describing uh, the motion of a rigid body is a translation and a rotation, which you know is something that we kind of figured out at the very beginning of this with the Cartesian system to describe translation and another system to describe rotation. What it's nice about you know, demonstrating the theorem is that you, know, you can use it uh, more rigorously. So you can be sure that that is the minimum unit of movement. So if that is if that is the minimum so one operation of translation of rotation. You know, in some cases, it might be, you might need to do some analysis, data analysis, to figure out, you know, I don't know, you throw something out, you know, there's like air resistance and um, you know, all these other uh, confusing factors but you can figure out uh, which degrees or which parts of the movement correspond to translation and which parts correspond to uh, rotation. There are definitely easier cases. For example, if I just move you know, from here to here, then um, my rotation operation is just the identity matrix, so I didn't rotate, I just had translation. And the other way uh, around is possible too. You don't have a translation, but you rotate, and it's actually the one that we're gonna look at. So, does this make sense? Can you think of a, you know, display God? Can you think of a better way to do it? It's hard. It's pretty, pretty compact. Okay, so before we separate it, when we're looking at the kinetic energy and the Lagrangian, we separated the kinetic energy of the center of mass and the kinetic energy of you know whatever was rotating uh, about the uh, center of mass. So we're going to do something similar here. And so the kinetic energy of this 
minimum unit is going to be um, I guess one half uh, m, this is the velocity of the center of mass squared, plus a kinetic energy that is going to be in terms of what? So this gives you the translation. What gives you the rotation? So phi, theta, and psi, the Euler angles. So as I mentioned in practice, it might not be super easy to separate the degrees of freedom, but you know, some of them might even uh, belong to two, but you can pick. You can uh, always separate them neatly into the degrees of freedom that are translation and the degrees of freedom that are rotation. So since we're talking about rigid bodies, you always have to draw a blob because you know it's a rigid body. So Use the same one. So we have our blob, a rigid body. What is the defining characteristic of a rigid body? The particles right, don't move with respect to each other, right? Yeah. Their, the distance between particles is constant. Good. So let's these two points. One is here and one is here. They are arbitrary. And we're going to define the vectors um, from the center or the origin of the Cartesian system, the space Cartesian system, to these points. That one's going to be R1, and this one's going to be R2. And there is a vector from R1 to R2 that we're just going to call R. That means that R2 is equal to R1 plus R. Remember that quantities like the torque 
where the angular momentum, for example, the angular momentum, um, what do we use for angular momentum? Oh yeah, L. Uh, what is this vector R? Be something else? Well, this is just some operation. And so, whatever you put in there, the R is going to give you the angular momentum with respect to that vector. And so, the center of mass one is the most useful one uh, because you only need one vector you know, to represent the actual um, angular momentum, the physical angular momentum. If you use a different vector, then you will have these and then you'll have to add you know, everything else and it will look pretty messy. So it's not necessarily only the center of mass it could be any vector, but the center of mass is the most useful one. So we're trying to figure out which vector, you know, we want to we want to economically represent um, a rotation of the rigid body. And we want to find the vector that will make that use as few variables as possible. And you already answered the question. It's going to be the center of mass. But we'll see why. So we have this relationship over here. All of that is with respect to um, space. So the R2D team in space coordinates is equal to the R1D team in space coordinates plus dr dt in space coordinates. So now we're going to use uh, the friend that we, that we rescued from chapter 4. We're going to operate on R. So mm, I'm going to put it over here. So dr okay, stop working. dr dt in space coordinates is equal to what? In body or rotation coordinates. It's dr dt in rotation coordinates plus the angular velocity cross 
All right. So we can substitute that one in here. What is the change in R? So remember that R is this vector over here. What is the change in R uh, with respect to time? So we just you know sit and wait in body coordinates. Why? Because it's algebra. Right. And we define R1 and R2, right? So from space, you see that R1 and R2 are moving, R is moving. But if you are on the rigid body, R is not moving. So in rotation coordinates, that term is 0. And so the RDT in space coordinates is just the angular velocity cross R. So I'm going to put it in there. And I'm going to call this one uh, omega 1, because I'm going to do this again. So omega 1 cross R. All right, cool. So that was equivalent to describing uh, R2, or actually the point over here, um, where R2 ends. We're describing this point in terms of the R1 coordinates. But we can do it the other way around. We can say this is the origin and this is the point that we're trying to describe. So in that case, R1 is R2 minus R. And we do everything the same. What are the directions of R2? The directions? Yeah, uh, they're arbitrary. They could be in any direction, but so what this is telling you is that to get to R1 through R2, you go to R2 first, and then the direction of R is a negative, so you have to switch it. So it is defined in this direction, so when you switch it, it's in this direction. So you can go from the origin to R1. Uh, but you know, this can move. Um, R1 could be over here and R2 over here. Um, so there's no like left and right direction. Uh, it's arbitrary. But this is always going to hold. And for this one, it's just you're just going to the direction of R1 and then in the, in the direction of R, and you get to R2. So we do the same thing over here with R1. Um, it's going to be R2. in space coordinates, and then we have minus r. So we have another minus in here. So we can just put a negative in here, or a minus. And this is the second time that we do it. So I'm going to call that one omega 2. So minus 
omega 2 cross r. So let's see how we can rewrite this one. Mm. I guess I just can add both of them, right? Yeah, like in grade school. So this will be dr2 dt plus dr1 dt equals dr1 dt plus dr2 dt plus omega1 cross r minus omega2 cross r. So if we move these ones to this side, what do we get? Zero. Zero. And so the end result of all of this is that, um, I'm going to put it right here, omega 1 cross r, actually omega 1 minus omega 2 cross r equals 0. So these are two angular velocities right, that we obtained using the um, space and rotation uh, system operator. Um, in general, they don't have to be the same. R is this vector over here. So if this expression is equal to zero, what must be true about omega 1, omega 2, and R? All of them are zero? One of them are zero. Mm -hmm. One of them have, has to be zero. We know that r is not zero. Um, so either uh, omega one equals omega two, yeah. or there's another option. So what is the definition of uh, cross product, the geometric definition? So magnitude of this one times magnitude of this one times sine of the angle between them. So if the sine is, sine zero is zero, right? So then uh, omega one and omega two can be whatever they want and you get zero. So that means that the angle between r and omega one and minus omega two is zero. So this expression is in, it's on this vector on r. Or uh, omega one minus omega two parallel to r. But you know, the real answer is this one. Omega one equals uh, omega two, because we just pick you know arbitrary vectors r one and r two. They can point in uh, in any direction. They can touch any point, and so you will get a line for every pair of r one and r two. So just by getting two points, you know, most likely you'll 
bring that down to either one point, you know, when the two R's cr uh, cross, or zero if they don't cross. So it's easy to see that uh, only one can be true in general. And so if omega one equals omega two, what does that tell us about the rotation of this rigid body? This could be like the plot for a movie, that there can only be one. There's only one angular velocity. And actually, that is a corollary to the definition of, of rigid body. What will happen if you had two omegas? You know, let's say one over here, one over here, they are you know, either in opposite directions or you know, the velocity is not exactly the same. What will happen to the particles of that, of that system? The momentum will not be constant? Yeah, right, it will be compressing or you know, there will be like voids. So that is not a rigid body. So this is actually a requirement of the rigid body. There's only one angular velocity. And you, know, you can define the angular velocity about any axis that you want. The best one is the center of mass. OK, so now we're going to look at the angular momentum. What is the definition of angular momentum for a system of particles? MR cross V. MR cross V. OK. What about the indices? What should I put in there? Uh, my RI yeah. and the sum. Yeah, right. So you just have it comes directly from the definitions. So, you know, we're doing graduate mechanics now. So, we write it in Einstein notation, and well, that's what you get. Uh, this one is equation five point one. So you know, welcome to chapter five. What is R, Ri? Is the distance uh, from what to particle I? Well, as we... Elemental mass? Center. Center of mass? Yeah, so we mentioned that um, R can be arbitrary. So we're going to constrain our system a little bit more. And we're going to say that 
there is no translation. There is just rotation. So to specify rotation, the Euler theorem tells you that you only need one point, then an angle, right? And every, everything is rotating about this point. The point can be inside of the rigid body or outside. So Ri is going to be the distance from this point about which everything is rotating and particle I. And Vi is the, the velocity of that particle. There is something interesting about this equation. V is the time derivative or the derivative of Ri with respect to time. But if the rigid body, you know, the particles in the rigid body cannot move, uh, what does that tell us about the velocity? Angular. Right. So if you have your, um, the point at which, about which everything is rotating over here, and you have your system over here, um, the particles cannot move with respect to each other, so they cannot really go out in the radial direction because there's no translation. So the only motion that they have is uh, angular, you said? So I will call it um, tangential, right? So, but it's the same thing, the angle. So the velocity comes only from the change in, the, um, in that position. There's no change in their magnitude. So we're going to apply 486 again, which sounds like a drone or something. We're going to apply it to R, this one. So you probably know it by now. The RDT in the space system is equal to the R DT in the rotation system rotating system plus the angular velocity cross R. And in the rotating system, in the rigid body, R cannot change by definition. All the distances are the same. So this term is zero. We have been exploiting that for a while. Uh, what is this? The RDT. Yes. We got about the I. Yeah. So actually, in general, it's just the velocity because we have both of these. Uh, we know that for this particular case, it's just the. Um, the tangential. So this is just uh, VI. That guy over there. So we can replace it or substitute, I guess. Uh, it will be the angular momentum is MI. Ri cross omega cross Ri. So we can use the the triple product identity. Um, that says mm, 
I'm going to put it up here. So the, the triple, huh? question? Triple product is A cross B cross C equals B um, A dot C minus C A cross B. So this guy is A, this guy is B, this one is C. So the angular momentum is Mi. Omega. And a dot c is just our i squared. It's not a vector anymore. Minus, for c, we do have that vector again. And a and b is we have, I oh, have to write the whole thing. Okay, so this is equation 5.3. So we're making some progress. Let's look at the components of the angular momentum vector. X component is going to be, I'm going to start over here, Mi and then we're going to have the X component of Omega. and. Our I squared is just our I squared, it's the magnitude. And then, I put it over here. Minus, which is that minus sign. And we're gonna get the X component of our I. So I'm just gonna call it XI. And then we have that dot product. And what is the algebraic definition of dot product? Magnitude of R. What is Ri in the, the, the x component of Ri? x. Hmm? It's, it's just x. So magnitude of x times magnitude of omega x. So xi omega x, yi omega y, zi omega z. Okay, it's actually not that bad. So we can, I'm not gonna do it, but we could write all of them. 
So Lx is going to look like, we're going to put together all the omega x, omega y, and omega z. So it's going to be mi. Can you, can, you, can you close the door, um, Marcos? So this one is Ri squared um, minus Xi times Xi, that's Xi squared. And then, uh, the for the y term that's going to be minus mi omega y xi yi and for the um, omega z term, we're going to have mi omega z xi um, zi. Okay, so well, this looks a little bit more not complex, but it's, it's complicated. There's a bunch of, of operations in there. So what we can see about the angular momentum is that Lx, Ly, and uh, Lz are a linear function of everything else in the system. So each component, this one is x, depends on omega x, omega y, and omega z. And xi, y1, I mean uh, yi, and zi. So all the possible uh, directions that you have in the system, you have them in each of the components. So this is actually a very complicated operation, the angular momentum. So, you know, we're going to have something like that for the y and z components. Do you remember how we um, described, I guess, which equations we used to describe a linear system? You know, after we look at this um, rotated system with all the cosines, we were able to abstract it a little bit. And so we're getting you know, like the A11, A12, A13, and so on. We had um, one of these for each component. So we had we had nine components. So if we want to write this down in these terms, so L X, L Y, and L Z, uh, what should these components be? I mean, these coefficients. Well, we already put it in terms of the omegas. So this is going to be this vector. 
is going to be equal to this matrix. What are we going to have over here? Uh, omega x, right? In this case, instead of using A, we're going to use this notation. What are those eyes? The coefficient of the omega x and the coefficient of the omega. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely going to be uh, in terms of the x eyes, uh, y eyes. The moment of inertia. Yeah, moment of inertia. Here you go. Um, So this whole thing, you know, the matrix, is the moment of inertia. So that means that we can write this equation for the angular momentum as L equals we're just going to call this I weekly because it's a matrix uh, omega vector. Which is very pretty. I mean, it hides all the ugly details, but it's pretty. So this one is equation 5.9. So this is interesting because it tells you that the angular momentum is a result of the moment of inertia operator operating on the angular velocity, which is different than Say if you have a scalar over here and it's just uh, the proportionality constant between those two things, the angular velocity and the angular momentum. Um, so just uh, very quickly to finish. So notice that even though we use uh, Lx, Ly, Lz, uh, omega x, omega y, omega z. Uh, but that just means that these components have to be orthogonal to each other. We didn't define the origin or the orientation of the of the systems. So uh, this is this is agnostic. You can put it anywhere you want and rotate it. Uh, you know, that's, that gives more, more power to this operator. The diagonal elements, so these ones, they have this form. And if you go to the continuous regime, so the separation of the particles is really tiny compared to the size of the object, then we have to use an integral. So it will be the volume integral.
and this is the mass density. Right, which um, you have probably seen both. And they're called uh, the moment of inertia coefficients. And the rest, the off-diagonal, they're called products of inertia. And they look more like this one over here. So, for example, xy is minus mi, xi, yi. And here you will have an integral representation also. And the name that you will typically hear for this thing is the moment of inertia tensor. It is a tensor. Um, it's a tensor of degree two, so it's a matrix. And it is a, an operator. So I guess all of those names are correct. The interpretation, you know, the active versus passive, um, over here is clear. The operator is operating uh, on the vector, not on the um, on the system. So it's not changing the components. It is definitely rotating uh, omega. And finally, uh, L, or uh, actually I, contrary to the rotation. Um, operators, it does have units. The units are kilograms times meter squared. And they are not, it doesn't have to be orthogonal. So yeah, cool. See you next time.